Welcome to Eat Sleep Code, the official Teller podcast. I'm your host, Ed Charbonneau, and with me today is my co-host, John Bristow, Mr. Octopus to Play himself. How you doing, John? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think that's the case, but whatever. Um, yeah, I uh, hope everyone's doing well out there and, uh, you know, focused on uh, doing all the great stuff around technology and staying safe at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we take this opportunity each week to uh, talk about interesting stuff that we found in technology news or programming. Um, we've got uh, a kind of a big news event for CES to talk about and some other things. So it should be pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah, CES is always a fun time to see all the crazy uh, pet uh, maintenance products, etc. that come out from a technology perspective. So we start out with a little bit of go first. Sure. So, so this, is, uh, yeah. this is something that you're you're dabbling in lately. Yeah. So uh, Go is a, a nice language. Um, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't say drop everything and start using Go, but um, just wanted to give folks a kind of a heads up that you know for a long time Go. Um, one of the things about Go is that it's actually been engineering to engineered to be extremely backward compatible. So for every release of the language that they ship. Uh, the, the folks working on it are very cognizant of the fact that there may be an implementation that breaks. Uh, this happens all the time with languages and frameworks. And so with Go, one of the main sort of features that they have in the languages is for extreme backwards compatibility. Um, in addition to that, there's also this contention where people want innovative features like generics to be added to the language. And so there's been a long-standing proposal for adding generics to Go. Generics is this idea that you can actually, at compile time, uh, I guess, have types uh, that are represented using uh, these these sort of generic types that are injected by the compiler at compile time and thereby having sort of a, a, a type safe way of actually having uh, your, your code structured. And so there's been this longstanding proposal around adding generics to Go. Um, it's, been, it's been in the works for actually quite a while now. And it looks like um, they're actually seriously considering it now. So this has been a longstanding pr proposal with Go. Um, if you've done any Go development, you'll know that there's a lot of boilerplate you have to write. And this is one of the things that generics helps with is you get rid of a lot of that boilerplate code that you typically have to write. So um, just as an FYI for people to keep aware of what's going on in the Go space, this is one of those things to be aware of. So Go and other languages, definitely worth taking a look at. Um, the things that are nice about Go is that it, it's extremely uh, parallel. Um, it's functional. 
and uh, runs really well, runs very really fast, is the basis for a lot of products that you may have heard of, like Terraform, for example. Um, and so this is kind of the the blog post to update us all on what's where when and where it's coming. I think I think I believe it's coming in 1.18. I think, um, but yeah, this is this is something that's slowly but surely coming to language. Looks like they've tried it before and failed. Yeah, they they have an implementation uh, that's implemented, um, but it, you have to get a, a specific beta of the implementation. Um, and the concern is the way that's been implemented. This stuff is not easy. You may remember back in, for example, .NET uh, 2 when they int introduced generics. Um, mm -hmm. That first came out as a beta. Um, unfortunately, they represented, uh, they used a character to represent the delimiter for, for generics in, this, in the MSLI that uh, did some nasty things. And so they had to change that in beta 2. And so these things are not easy. And there's a lot of thinking that has to go around this. We want to make sure they get it right the first time because you can't really backport, you know, features. If you have this policy of extreme backwards compatibility, you got to get it right the first time. So that's why they've been looking at it uh, for a while now. I'm kind of curious as to what, uh, what drives companies to make new programming languages. We've got quite a few that are, you know, pretty um, feature rich and complete these days. Uh, is there anything that Go is trying to do that, you know, most of the modern languages don't? Well, the, the thing that came, this came out of obviously from Google. And so Google's all about extreme parallelism and scale, which is one of the core tenets of, of Go, which is functional, scalable, and, and can basically uh, be used to run uh, server architectures um, with very lightweight processes and threads, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a design feature around Go, I think this was back in the early 2010s, et cetera, where Google was building this because they needed um, a lightweight sort of, uh, but highly parallel and scalable uh, language for building these things. And I think they found like C++ and, C sh and, and other C derivatives weren't giving that for them, so. And Chicken um, Man says, why didn't they just yeah. add it from the beginning? Yeah, um, it's always easy to look retrospectively and say, you know, why didn't they add this at the beginning? I think, you know, initially they looked at this as, you know, generics. You can you can do generics. You don't need generics, basically. And generics is just sort of a, it's a compiler feature, basically. Um, but it does, if you, without it, you have to write, as I said, a lot of boilerplate. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's just one of the trade-offs, I guess. They wanted to get something out and implemented well. And then generics was always... I mean, it's been in, in the back of people's minds for about the last three or four years around Go. And people have been pushing on this idea. I certainly would love to see generics because I've been doing Go development for the past few months. And I, I would like to have it because there is a lot of boilerplate in my code. Um, but this isn't anything new. People know this is coming, but I just wanted to provide an update on it. Yeah, we were talking about generics on um, on our live stream a couple weeks ago. We were doing some Signal R. Uh, we're building a card game, Alyssa and I, and um, yes. I wrote a um, shuffle function, and uh, I just went ahead and made it generic, even sure. though it wasn't really necessary to make it generic, but uh, Alyssa was asking what, what it was generic, or what the generic part of it did. I was like, well, now we can shuffle anything. It doesn't have to just yes. shuffle a deck of cards. It can yes. shuffle a list of strings or, you know, any type of type that you want to add to that you can go sure. ahead and shuffle that array and it's not dynamic it's that sta it's statically built compiler time implemented you get all the type safety and all the runtime heuristics around that so yep so they're they're super handy they let you write more scalable code not scalable in the sense of scales across uh, multiple threads but in the sense that you don't have to rewrite versatile something. yeah it's more versatile i guess yeah is a better way to say it i think yep lot more flexible it can handle a lot more uh, parameters you throw at it and stuff so uh, speaking of um, uh, languages uh, one that I take a look at every once in a while is rust I haven't yes. really written anything in it or I don't live in that ecosystem but it's fun to watch uh, this yes. one grow uh, so this was a um, log rocket post and they were talking about the state of Rust web frameworks. And this is a really excellent right. breakdown. Um, Rust has been trying to break into the web market with um, the WebAssembly stuff. So essentially, you're writing Rust code that gets compiled into WASM. And uh, it's 
got some opportunity, but uh, there's a lot of confusion. It's still early um, in the days of you know WebAssembly and Rust being a thing, so there's a lot of frameworks that are building up around it, and they don't have the um, the same kind of traction as something like Blazor right now. So there's no company like Microsoft that's like fully focused on building a web framework. So it's all these little community frameworks that are springing up everywhere. So this is a nice breakdown of uh, each one of those frameworks and what they do. Um, and most importantly, uh, they tell you whether this is like a production ready uh, framework or it's just like somebody's hobby project or it's sure. a beta or something like that. So I thought this was really interesting and there's so many and we can't really go through all of them and kind of pick at which ones do what. Uh, but I did notice it's interesting that there's some that do uh, server-side operation as well. So they have like a server-side, client-side model. Uh, so there's quite a bit of, um, you know, stuff that we use in .NET. Just it's, yeah. Know, it's yeah, all these web frameworks there. are largely the same. I mean, this was largely popularized by Rails, mm -hmm. uh, which is a web framework for Ruby. And then... Uh, the ASP.NET team stole, I guess, uh, leveraged uh, some of their ideas, but they all borrow from each other. So there's always these consistent ideas you see across web stacks, um, state management, routing, um, generation of angle brackets, so you know, ORM built in. sure. Or I don't know if that would fall in that necessarily in that, that sort of, um, space in my opinion, because ORMs can be applied to, um, non web scenarios, mm -hmm. but they all, this seems to be the sort of canonical framework that's generated by language implementers yeah. when uh, there's a need for it. People want to spit out angle brackets and, and such. So these are a natural evolution of the language. And it's, it's actually a good, they're actually a really good uh, use case for testing out languages and, and features and such because there's so many things that web frameworks have to do. Uh, and there's so much network dependencies and um, scalability is a massive, massive capability that needs to be implemented. So it's a good use case for the designers of a language to target, um, which is why it gets it so, and the fact that the web is so popular. So it makes sense. Read, reading an article like this makes me wonder, though. I mean, there, there's like a half a dozen or more front-end frameworks and a half a dozen or more back-end frameworks. And it, you're running into one of those situations where it's like, the standard's not good enough. Let's write another standard. And yeah if these all these different projects would kind of merge together and kind of focus fire on something you could get something like a, a blazer style framework built sure uh, but you know everybody's got to have their side hustle yeah <laughs> what's what's really sad about this is that there hasn't been much of an evolution in terms of web frameworks themselves i'm not talking about from the client side i'm talking about from the server side everyone seems to do the same thing from the server side you could make an argument that the folks on the ruby side are doing some interesting things um but generally speaking, we still have the same primitive concepts, and those concepts haven't changed too much. I don't think they actually take into account a lot of the things that are being done on the protocol side, such as Speedy or HTTP3, um, that I think would be interesting to account for. But um, that being said, I think uh, you know this is a, this is sort of the canonical way in which we do things on the web on the back end, and yeah. so ORMs will continue to exist, state management will continue to be you know something that people have to contend with. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, it would be interesting to see if Rust could, because of this, the way that Rust is, is that it's, it's a very, it's a very interesting language. There might be some things that it can do that might impose a different model, if you will, of tackling the, the problem of building out a web backend. And I would be interested to see if they have any ideas around that. I don't know, but it would be interesting to yeah. see that. It, it's speed is a real factor with Rust. I mean, it's supposed to be the go-to language if you want the speed of C++, but some of the ease of a compiled, you know, C-sharp type, a higher level language. So it'd, it'd be really nice to see this pick up and one of these frameworks really take off and gain some real traction, but uh, I haven't quite seen that yet. Uh, mm. So I keep watching and waiting. Um, there's some uh, interesting stuff you can do at webassembly.studio. I believe is the web address. Yeah. Yeah, I think this generates yes, a Rust project. Yeah. So you can you can dabble in Rust, which is about all I've done, but it's still um, it's still you know pretty interesting to see 
what it's capable of uh, sure. and, and how, how a project with Rust would get built. So you can go to webassembly.studio and just file a new Rust project and run it. It's yep. pretty neat to see the kind of the syntax and the interaction that it, it has with the browser and stuff. So there's some promise there. It's just uh, stoking that fire and getting it to something bigger hasn't quite happened yet. Hasn't taken off. All right, John. So we're talking about languages. And when we write code, we name things. Naming yes. things is hard. So we've got a <laughs> cheat sheet for naming things now. Yeah, it's the classic the classic uh, joke uh, around computer science is there are two hard problems in computer science and one of them is naming things. I, I can't remember the joke, but that's that's the classic one is coming up with names is always a challenge. And so this is a very uh, concise but um, thorough uh, cheat sheet guide around naming conventions and in, in a way that's language agnostic. So um, obviously it's a little bit more of a, an opinionated version of this, but the reason why this is important is because obviously when you're naming things, you want to make sure that you're not doing so in a way that um, might conflict with languages or, you know, will give you some uniformity across your languages as you're targeting them. So it goes through a list of sort of recommendation guidelines around what to do and what not to do when naming variables and types. So, yeah. Yeah, there's some. So that would be interesting in for people to reference. We were talking about this last week as well. Like, how do you name variables and Boolean values? And, um, there's a couple couple that I rules of thumb that I use there. Um, yeah, this is all very helpful stuff. Yeah, There's a little bit. I do around I do like thing. using uh, is and has for booleans. Mm -hmm. I you know is something has something, um, get set, update, etc. Those are good verbs I think to use mm -hmm. as well. Keep them short and and simple. And I think one of the things we tend to forget is that obviously non-English speakers are going to be reading this code as well. So you want to try and keep things uniform and simple so that they translate well when people are reading the code. I can only imagine, like, you know, we're pretty, we're pretty blessed in the fact that the, the canonical language is English for a lot of these programming languages. And yeah. we take that for granted, I think, a lot of times. I can only imagine how difficult it would be to not only, one, come into a computer industry that is highly mature, relatively speaking, uh, as opposed to when you and I got in the industry. And then secondly, if you're a non-English speaker, now having to learn like, okay, this doesn't translate for me, how does this work? And all the code examples and all the documentations in English as well, suddenly yeah, you gotta start imagine. learning English in order to get into this. And imagine you're like, this is the one thing you wanna do in life, you know, and but you're, la you're limited by your ability to learn new languages, then, you know, that's gonna be a challenge. But anyways, um, this allows you to, you know, uh, target this in a way that, uh, you know, provides can uniformity, I guess, across your code. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> Emergent <coughs> systems. What are we talking about here, John? This is <laughs> so um, this was actually an interesting article. Basically, it's it's sort of like, you know, here's what I like about certain dev tool capabilities. Um, mm -hmm. It's in particular, this is for Chrome DevTools, which is the uh, built-in developer tools for Chrome. Um, so if you have Safari or Chrome or thing, some derivative of Chromium uh, or V8 or whatever, uh, the DevTools come along for the ride. And so there's a lot of sort of tips and tricks in this. And this is just this blogger's favorite ones. There are a few that I like, but generally speaking, I think you know, when you're learning how to program or you're learning how to target a framework, whether it's web or otherwise, one of the most powerful things you can learn is how to debug. And so yeah. DevTools is where, you know, that becomes your friend. And there's a bunch of tips and tricks and such that are listed here that are that are very important if you're a web developer to learn. Um, so this, this person references variables uh, through the dollar sign zero notation, which mm -hmm. gives you the access to the, uh, I believe, the last selector that was implemented, for example. Um, so you can do inspect elements on these things. Um, there's all sorts of tips and tricks you can use for these. Monitor events is one. Uh, there's things like trace points that I like. Um, there's, there's all sorts of capabilities that you can, you can use when learning how to use these things. And um, Chrome DevTools is wonderful. That's part of the reason why it's so popular with developers is because of the DevTools that it has. And you'll see other vendors follow suit like Mozilla and Edge. They realize that this is 
a feature that has to be prioritized in the browser, not just so much rendering stuff, but what does the developer experience look like? And so Firefox has got to have great dev tools. Edge has got to have great dev tools to compete for mind share of the developers who are targeting those browsers. Yeah, I would like to see um, some conference sessions and stuff based around this. I've seen some in the past. It's been a long time sure. since I've, I've seen somebody do a good one of these. Yeah. Uh, it's changed so much since the last time I watched one of those sessions. It'd be good to see another one, um, yeah. the modern updated version of it. Um, one of my favorite dev tools that not a lot of people know about, um, it was it was implemented a while back, and then it was taken out, and then it was added back in again, was the 3D view of the DOM. Um, well, not so mm -hmm. much the DOM, but basically the uh, the element model that's rendered to the yeah, page, so it's painted to the screen, and like it was in Firefox. Index. Yeah, yeah. So you could actually rotate it and and see um, what elements were where, and you know, if you had a Z index of nine million or something like that, you could uh, you could see it. And it would give you a really uh, really visceral experience around what the actual uh, layer model looks like. Um, and then it would always look great when you you know showed people what you were building, um, as opposed to modifying Z index values, etc. So I always liked that feature just because like a hokey thing. I never used it religiously, but it was one of those things that I did use. The one that I tend to not see a lot, but I find incredibly useful, are trace points. This was, I think, the first time I ever saw this was in Visual Studio, where instead of breaking, you actually output, or you can do a conditional trace point where you know how you typically inject log statements. So mm -hmm. you'll say, if I got here, console.writeLine or printf or whatever, um, that was a common sort of thing. But the problem was is you would litter your code with these things. And sometimes you didn't want to do that. You would just, what you could do instead is add trace points, which were basically like breakpoints, but instead of actually breaking execution, it would actually just output to the console. And that was always a powerful feature in my, in my opinion. I always liked that capability. And I saw it first in... Visual Studio, and then um, it's now supported in um, tools like Dev Tools, like Chrome, uh, which are which are great, um, and you can do all kinds of interesting things with them. Um, here, you're showing off obviously the uh, the applied styles, and you can do all kinds of things with those. There's a huge listener event uh, structure that's associated with uh, obviously painting stuff to the screen. There's the classic DOM content loaded event, etc., but other ones as well that you can set up. These are set up automatically by the browser, but there's ones that you can inject yourself, and uh, that's supported through a variety of means. I'm trying to remember, there there was one um, you could trigger like CSS events to, or, or not trigger them, but uh, break on them. So if you trigger like a hover state, it would actually yep. like, pause the browser. There, there's lots of uh, little hidden gems like that in here. I can't remember where that one's at, but it's in here somewhere. Yeah, so these are these are these are you're basically applying styles to uh, the the rendered content dynamically through that styles tab. Um, there are a number of ways in which you can capture these, um, and I think that they have to do with the depends on when you're w how you're wanting to capture these things. So you can capture them like for example through uh, the console. You can apply them on elements, etc. I'm not a I'm not a huge uh, CSS guy, so I, I, I'm not the, the best when it comes to targeting that. But when it comes to JavaScript, for example, um, that's where I tend to use trace points a lot. Yeah, there, there's uh, there's sometimes you need to really like set weird breakpoints and stuff where something's disappearing. You can't figure out why. It only does it when you're you know on some certain part of the page or when. Well, this actually this, this it place. goes right through like here. It's one. actually monitor events. If you you can see right here, so. Monitor events API will allow you to see all the events that are received by DOM, any DOM element. So mm -hmm. it shows you how, by uh, utilizing monitor events, you can actually see all the basically events that that filter through to an, a particular event itself. So. And uh, Chris Demars says uh, he loves the screenshot feature. Sure. So there's a way to do screen captures. You can you can record like a set of captures too, if I remember yes. correctly. So yes. you can watch like uh, as the page loads and how it looks when it's uh, rendering and things. Yes. Uh, blogging for devs.com. Yes. Got, so this is basically, um, there's a lot of blogs out there, as we know. And um, what this is, is basically uh, a curated, if you will, um, list of the top developer blogs that are out there. The problem with blogs is that it's not only, they start off with tech blogging, but then they became everything. Um, and so 
what this is is basically a listing based on technology you can break it down by technology of the the top blogs that are out there so i know that blogs aren't you know tend to be all that popular anymore but there are uh, listings based on the technology of choice that you wish to target. So if you break it down by JavaScript, you break it down by others, you can see the, the trending there, um, and then subscribe as needed. Nice. I like that. Yeah. I'm to bookmark that one. Yeah. I'm so it's just a little site there. Blogs. Uh, sure. Sure. Trying to, try to use an aggregator these days, just, I don't know. I can't quite seem to use one of those with any success anymore. Used to have yeah, the, the uh, fiddle... Uh, was it called the fiddle uh well there was there was google reader for the longest time and feedly. then i think most people jumped over to feedly uh which is the one i have and feedly is good because it actually does aggregation across on your behalf so on the subjects that you like it will actually find additional sources it will also be able to pull in other types of uh sources as well so it will search across a variety of not just blogs but other things as well I think it actually utilizes Google search as part of its algorithms. They say it's AI, but you know, mm -hmm. I don't know what they're doing, but yeah, Feedly is the one that I use. Yeah. I used to, used to really enjoy the Feedly app for the um, iPad. That was another good one. So yes. Give you a nice UX with the articles that you're reading. Yes. CES was huge. <laughs> I think it was, it was huge, but it was virtual. So, um, yes. It's the first time it's ever been virtual in its history. So that's kind of a milestone. Can't wait to see all the garbage that's going to end up in the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> oh, you're so cheerful, John. But you're correct. Yeah. You're not wrong, my friend. You're not wrong. Um, this will all be garbage someday. Yes. Uh, we saw a lot of, like, touchless devices. Um, yes. Nobody wants to touch anything these days. Yes. Uh, I wonder why. Um, what huge. Razer's got a, a mask? Interesting. Yeah. It's like a gamer mask or something. No, this is um, this is an N95 mask. Yeah, it's a gamer mask. Uh, so what is what is actually kind of cool about this one is the fact that it's clear. So you can see the people's lips move, right? So for yeah. people who yeah need to to read lips, for example, if they're if they're deaf, for example, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So that that's that's a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's uh, serious. No, this is good. I like this one. I like this one. Uh, I just thought I thought it was amplified. like RGB colored and all that, you know, um, being gamer and all that. Um, so I think it's lit, but I don't know if it's colored. But uh, that's that's actually a speaker, I believe. Okay. So it, uh, it looks does, like a filter uh, to me, but whatever. Amplification. So. It's got a built-in. I think it's a filter. They're N95. They're, they've got filters. It has so. a ventilator ventilator pod, but I also read somewhere that it has a speaker that helps oh, project okay. your voice so it doesn't sound muffled. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Um, it doesn't say it in this little quick bit here, but something I watched Interesting. on. Oh, maybe there right. it is. comes with a sanitization case. Um, let's see. It talks about the... Uh, this is, yeah, this is exactly, yeah, I just, ugh. all right, whatever. <laughs> Gets a little whatever. bit of uh, steam, or what is it called? The, uh, that 27, 2077 game that's real big, real big right now? Uh, yeah, Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk. It's into that yeah. uh, kind of look a little bit. Yeah, um, you'd think so, but I'm not getting a Cyberpunk vibe from this. I'm getting a more of this is really depressing vibe, but... <laughs> whatever so this dystopian future we're heading yeah uh, i just we're, what problem are we solving you know let's better, solve the big problems mask. i mean okay if you think about it too you said uh, this is all stuff to end up at the bottom of the ocean someday well yeah the, instead of replacing this entire mask there are smaller replaceable uh filters so i mean that's that's less garbage than a disposable mask i suppose yeah i, I don't think so so i'm not i'm not going with this one fail <laughs> just it's done it's done john puts his stamp of disapproval on it um speaking of stamps of disapproval this one got a lot of news and i thought this was ridiculous so what an ice cream maker ice cream at home so for some reason you want to talk about stuff ending up at the bottom of the ocean my friend yeah look at that thing uh, look how much plastic and metal is in that thing yeah, yeah. disposable canisters Ugh. Jeez. not to mention this thing's like a grand 
So, really? Uh, yeah. That thing looks heavy too. That thing is going to go right to the bottom. <laughs> right to the bottom of the. Well, maybe it'll be a um, uh, faux reef or something someday. There's that Margaritaville uh, episode of South Park that's triggering for me right now. So, yeah, yeah, I think a lot of people. This could be the 2021 could be the year of soft serve, and then <laughs> who knows where these end up? Like, there, it's like. Uh, the problem I have with this is not the fact that people are trying to innovate and provide solutions. I have no problem with that. The problem I have is what happens later. And I've seen the after effects of things like bike companies, these rent for hire bike companies mm -hmm. that end up sending, shipping them all off to China. And then they get thrown into some kind of forest somewhere. And you can find like thousands and thousands of bikes piled up, just basically rusting away. And my, this sort of consumerism stuff is, I mean, Look at this. Look at the video on the right. Like, yeah, this is what we're going to do. Hang out, the, hang out with it at the water cooler as we get our soft serve. It's like, can you believe they're doing this now? And I'm yeah. like, yeah, I really don't want this to happen. Like, I think we can do without this, to be honest. Not to mention, and this isn't the most appetizing that, thing just, to watch. Just, just like, I just, this is just bad. Like, <laughs> like you're watching it's a this. snap. And then, yeah, <laughs> no one worries about the after effects of this, this monstrous 50 kilogram machine what do we do with this now now that you know whoever makes this thing has decided to stop selling these canisters and like there's only so much soft serve like look, he's in a suit and tie he's making so oh, you <laughs> clever guy making soft serve <laughs> you can make margaritas i like i would love to be on the boardroom of this and like just be like guys can we consider the environmental effect of like shipping out all this plastic and metal everywhere you know like do people really want soft serve this much but whatever if so. you're if you if you're gonna drop five hundred to a grand on a kitchen appliance, sure, make it an espresso machine, please. Not, not yeah, a fair enough. Because you're gonna drink coffee. A... You're gonna drink coffee for a while, I would think. Yeah. More so than soft serve. Not soft serve. Yeah. That's just. So all right, what what else? Silly. What other I mean, killer products do we have? <laughs> kudos for them thinking outside the box, I suppose. But that's yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, um, th those were some of the ones. Rollable that phone. Wait, 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 wait. The LG rollable phone. The rollable Go back to the phone. LG rollable phone. Let's see what monstrosity this thing is. All right, more to more to explore. LG rollable. Let's see what this thing won't is. Let me click. I oh, heard good. your insults, and they yes, no exactly. Let me stream content. Move over um, foldables. The rollables are on the way. All right, let's see what this does. Okay, apparently it's shrinking somehow. I don't know how that works. So is it like? Like a scroll. Look at the guy. He's not even moving. Oh. Like he is so still because they oh, know okay. they, this has not been industrial tested. <laughs> so it's like a scroll. Okay. And it can change size depending on what you uh, Why? want. Why? Just use your finger. Scroll with your finger. <laughs> I think I think the idea here is uh, eventually it will get smaller so you can pull your little scroll okay. out of the pocket. Okay. I'm thinking of a new do. show, Ed. Bad technology. And it's just... a phone and a tablet, John. <laughs> it's a phone and a tablet. We know all right, how well so... those combo devices always turn out. All right. So more to explore. How, what does this thing cost? How so... much battery is it going to take? Like, this is like one of those fold-out, you know, deck chairs you see, you know, and just like, but it doesn't go back enough, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> it's like people struggle with their airline seats. Now I've got this phone that can, that can... Yeah. I mean, like, people are trashing us on the chat, but I don't care. I mean, it's like, yeah, a fold-out screen where it pops open, it's mechanical. It makes sense. But this thing looks like it's actually, like, going mum, 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 like, like a raised <laughs> desk, you know, sort of thing. I don't like this at all. That thing's going to break. Then what? Now you're stuck with this, like, non-expandable phone. So Rollable phone. I thought it was Johnny Mnemonic where it would just, like, roll out on a table. But There were other uh, roll-up roll LCD devices being um, kind of demoed. like a fruit roll up sort of thing. They were kind of vaporware, but they were they yeah were just like you know, this is what we're going to build in the next ten years. Type That's of fine. Thing. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy as it. long as this stuff is not getting mass produced. I'm I'm okay with people experimenting, which is fine. So there was one. What 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 like, what was? Wait, slow down. You're you're scrolling past all these interesting looking things. What oh, else sorry. was? What was that bear one? I saw a bear there. Bear. A that bear. one. These Charmin robots make us wonder, is pooping the, what? Where you scroll past oh. the title. There you go. Is pooping the next tech frontier? Oh, God, yes. Yes, this is exactly what a, this is exactly what we need, Ed. 
Because so toilet like, paper, as you know, toilet paper in the pandemic is at a premium. So let's target those people by creating a bear operated poop toilet pe- <laughs> toilet paper dispenser. Is this like when you're stranded, you just get out your phone? I, I'm, I'm assuming that nobody what already do? has their phone what out is on this? the toilet, but you get out your phone and then you you kind of summons the poo bot to come bring what you is this? A is this a Is this a robot that brings you toilet paper? I think it is. It is. Okay, hang on. Rollbot, a self-balancing robot that connects to your phone and will deliver a fresh toilet roll directly to you. I think people are just taking the piss here. Like people are just like, whatever. Let's give them a robot that delivers toilet paper. <laughs> Man, like we're putting all this engineering and technology know-how into solving just like problems we really don't have. You know, this is uh, this is what happens when you take engineers and you make them stay home for a year and self quarantine. <laughs> this is the results you get. Ugh. There was one. Wow. Uh, we were talking about scrollable devices, though. There was one that was like a giant chair. I can't seem to find it on here. I think it was Razer okay. also, and the screen was rollable. Like it gave you like a panorama, like 180 degree screen once it all scrolled out. Okay. So there, there's some innovations being attempted so 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 it's like one of those um it's like what are are those things that you go to where you see the stars the um oh oh yeah god Uh, (laughs) i can't remember the name of it (laughs) planetarium planetarium thank you so you can create your own little mini planetarium around your head so perfect yeah so there there was some like uh examples of how it could be used for that uh so it, it basically took a screen and condensed it into like a small panel but when you sat down it gave you like the whole 180 degrees around you which uh i i'm wondering how long screens are gonna last before we just start putting the stuff on our face anyway so i know i know you're no. a big fan of that John. Get, get away from my face do not hack my face thank you i'm so sick and tired of companies trying to hack my face leave my face alone thanks there was a lot of uh, VR and AR devices uh, I'm sure. at CES as well. They're not in the CNET thing, but... Uh, oh, that's the new product, so you got to go to the latest or must-see categories, I guess. That's where they have the other stuff. Uh, yeah, Beauty so. and wellness products, best of shows, some flying car, apparently. I don't know what this is. Green tech. Kitchen tables, perfect. Yep, this is just what you want to hear. <laughs> There's our mask again. Here we go, LG. We're going to reimagine the kitchen table. See if they have a photo of it here, because this is a, this is the LG rollable. Light. Yeah, that's the one we just looked at. Smartphone. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Air Taxi. Yeah, the, yes, yes, the Air, Air Taxi. taxi. <laughs> Welcome to Johnny Cab. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect analogy. Wow, there. Uh, my light. I am so important that I need an Air Taxi. I can't be down in the traffic with you people. I have to be up above. <laughs> Robot Butler. Yeah. I think I was you know, if someone if I go to someone's house and I'm greeted by a robot, I'm leaving right away. I'm like, this person clearly does not want to even make the effort of <laughs> greeting me at the door. <laughs> so I, I agree and disagree at the same time. Again, you got to remember a lot of these things. First of all, they're going to go to the uh, lazy and extremely wealthy. But secondly, they need accessibility needs are, are big. Uh, if you can get them to those people. No, that's that's where you could really help. Some you know, we're slowly out. be calling. We're we're slowly but surely becoming the Wally generation. You know, hey robot, yeah. I require more more toilet paper. Bring me more toilet paper. It's like, uh, all right, ceiling fan, smartest ceiling fan, la- ceiling lamp we've ever seen. So okay. this one uh, helps with senior citizens in motion and detects if okay. they've fallen this one not, this one may so be not bad because you remember we had the um i fallen and can't get up technology i yeah. can't remember what that was called again the life alert little okay thing that you yeah that press that yourself. has a good that addresses a good scenario i think and so if this is something similar um then good that's that's actually a good solution i think but this toilet roll bringing robot no i, I yeah. can't see in one toilet yeah. bowl bringy robot all right on that note we'll talk about some yep. Batman for a little bit <laughs> I think we're done. CES has been burned to the ground 
They're they're gonna watch your review there, John, and just cancel CBS uh, for twenty years. Look, I'm a moron, years. okay? I don't know what I'm talking about, but you know, I do know I've I've been in this industry long enough that I've seen these things come and go, and I'm like, uh, like I said, I would just I wouldn't even I would just want to sit where eating popcorn on these board meetings where they're like, what if what? Okay, now let me finish. Now, what if we did this? Like, you know how robots are really popular, right? Now, toilet paper is also popular. What if we what if we combine the two? You know, it's like okay, okay we're done. <laughs> Blockchain toilet paper. <laughs> Uh, um entity framework the plan for 6.0 yeah so jeremy lickness gave us a quick update here on you know the plan for entity core entity framework core 6.0 uh entity framework core obviously is used by a lot of dotnet developers um obviously on the dotnet core side of things and provides a great number of features for uh, as an orm um and so they're adding more support for some highly requested features as you can see here so Temporal tables, JSON columns, uh, order for uh, columns, performance improvements, yada, yada, yada. So it's a typical sort of, hey, here's what we're working on. Um, migrations is obviously a hot topic in the EF always. space. So uh, that's always like uh, migrations. I always look at them like, ah, good luck with all that. Migrations are, are, are gnarly, to say it lightly. This is one so. I wanted to look at here. Cosmos database provider. We're actively gathering feedback on which improvements to make in the Cosmos provider. So okay. they're looking for feedback. And I tried this and yeah. it works. It works. But when you use it, you have to go in knowing uh, what it is to expect from Cosmos because mm. you're going from an ORM to a flat file system. Sure. So a NoSQL type of system. And yes. when you're writing those link statements, uh, you can get yourself into a situation where they're, you're just writing really bad code. Uh, so you gotta be really careful with that one. I, I had a little bit of a time wrapping my head around uh, what I was supposed to be doing with it. Well, they resolve fast, so there's that. You know, and if you're trying to if you're trying to micro optimize, I think, especially when you're talking to the back end, that does matter, especially yeah. on a scale. So uh, so lots see. of stuff there that I just mentioned it so folks are aware. Investigations. GraphQL. Yeah, GraphQL is awesome. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think GraphQL is really the next step we as an industry need to take in terms of APIs. Uh, so GraphQL came out of Facebook, and it's basically a way of – it's sort of – the best way I can describe it, if you know T-SQL where you can construct your own queries, mm -hmm. GraphQL is the web API version of that. So basically yeah. instead of saying get – customers you say here is a hey graphql endpoint here is the structure of data i wish to have which may tie in customers and orders and kind of put it in a structure that you wish and in addition to returning that in the in the form that i'd like also provide me the paging and sorting capabilities that I, that i would also like as well so graphql is basically trying to evolve this very primitive dialogue that we tend to have on the api restful api level where you do gets sets, updates, deletes, etc. basically mimicking the HTTP puts uh, and posts um, sort of verbs that we have. And also we're at the we're also at the um, at the, the we're, we're actually at the mercy of the API writers themselves. Like if they we can't say no, 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 don't give me the structure this way, or the structure I want it that way. This is what GraphQL allows you to do. It gives you the flexibility of defining the output that you wish to see. Yeah, it'd be good to see them make the transition from sending your request through GraphQL and making the right SQL query to hit the yeah. database. This this basically unlocks you from the sort of one to one or one two to one binding that you typically see in API clients, where you you define a model, you define a client, and you just kind of plow through all the APIs and you just map them all and just write them out that way. Mm -hmm. This way, you just have one client, which is your GraphQL client, and then you let the client, the people using your client come up with the descriptions of the way they want their queries to look. And uh, it looks like there was some network improvements with .NET 5 back in November. Yeah, so basically a lot of uh, improvements in the networking stack. And this is more of an informational sort of thing. But if you're talking to your boss about, hey, we really should get to .NET 5, or we're on currently on 2 whatever or 3, maybe a move to .NET 5 is warranted. 
Um, this is more evidence in the arsenal of articles that you can provide your boss or the, the engineering manager who you're talking to about why you should think about moving to .NET 5. And so these are really good because a lot of people require evidence as to why you would make a change rather than just saying it's a new version. And so I like these articles because they actually provide that. Yeah, I like so, that yeah, .NET can't... has um, built-in uh, HTTP responses that are really easy to use. Sure. And it looks like there's some stuff around cancellation and cancellation tokens. That's nice to have. Uh, these these little patterns that they put together help developers not make silly mistakes. Yeah, like you might wonder, like how does this actually play out? Well, if you've ever used an application, especially on Windows, and you do you click on a button and then you wonder if anything happened, you click again and then the whole screen goes white. That sort of faded, fade to white. Uh, a pause in the execution of the program this is typically because of the network so networks are notorious at giving you hangs and pauses and unexpected hangs and pauses in your your apps and so um yeah it's one of those things where by implementing cancellation tokens and things like that where if someone if the user clicks on it again or tries to cancel then you can actually cancel it you don't have to resort to well the os will resort to turning your screen all white <laughs> So. Yeah, this is a little handy one they've added uh, fairly recently. It's, yeah. uh, you just write off the response, say ensure success status code. And you don't have to sit there and sniff for like all the 200 codes to make sure it came across okay. You just say yeah. ensure it was a success. And if it's not a success, it'll throw an exception. And then you can, can you can catch it and find out what kind of exception it was. So that's yeah. super handy. Fair enough. Yeah, so there's some other innovation. It's a pretty long post. There's a lot of new innovations that have been added specifically around the performance in .NET 5. And so these are just some of the things, but you know, like cross-platform implementation, extension points for sockets, et cetera, et cetera. It just goes on and on and on and on. Yeah, that's quite quite a long post. They, they really mm -hmm. added a lot of stuff in .NET 5 in general. Yes. So there you go. Uh, Visual Studio. You can't name a product 2020 anymore. You got to keep it out of the 2020 was not a year that we had. <laughs> yeah, it's, so. It should. It should be named 2020 because it sure feels well, like it when you use yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, we're still dating it back two years now. It's 20, 2019, but that's fine. I don't really don't care. But uh, basically a, a beta of some of the new innovations that are coming. Um, so this is version 16.9 preview three. So it's the first preview of 2021. Uh, new features that you can add. These are safe to install. Back in the day, they were not. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the day, be... you oh. yeah, you'd have to install this and then reformat your OS. Um, so these are safe to <laughs> install. The... Yeah, yeah. You, you, so they're safe that to was, install. That you was can go ahead and run. True. Like if you install yeah. Visual Studio for VB6 and Visual Studio for C++, your system would die. Your system wouldn't die. You couldn't open any either of those two things anymore. And sure. the only way to get them back was to reinstall the entire machine and pave it. <laughs> yep, fun stuff. So we've all been there. So yeah, lots of lots of really interesting sort of capabilities. I haven't actually gone through this list, but I just saw this and thought, yeah, yeah in case anyone's living on the bleeding edge, this is something to check out. Yeah, I need to try this and see if it solves my Visual Studio hanging problem. Nothing can solve how bad of a coder you are, Ed. I'm sorry. So my Visual Studio <laughs> instance hangs every few minutes. Yeah. And uh, I have yet to figure out what's causing it. I've tried repair installs and everything, and it just doesn't care. It's like, I'm just going to hang. And, um, yeah. Anyhow, uh, we have some huge releases to talk about with uh, Telerik. So join us uh, tomorrow for our webinar. You can go to telerik.com, click the yellow banner, and you can join us for our release webinar. We have all of the new things <laughs> for 2021. Now, awesome. Telerik and Kendo UI, like huge, huge releases this year. Um, we've got 65 components now in Blazor. A lot of the components that are already there were updated. Uh, so there's um, a lot more components in there that are um, going to help you build those line of business style applications and stuff. There's uh, updates for um, Telerik UI for core and MVC. Uh, we've got a couple new components there as well. Lots of updates. I mean, this list just goes on. You want to talk about that the .NET 5 post. I mean, this is a similar type of a post. It sure. just goes on for days with yep. all the different tools and all the stuff that they've added. Um, Test Studio is ramping up to really 
be a heart heavy hitter with Blazer. Um, Just Mock is getting some love. I mean, it just goes on and on. So we've got our release webinar tomorrow. If you want to hear all the awesome. details on this stuff, join cool. us for that. Sam and I, Sam Basu and I are going to do our best. I've been working on a little uh, demo this week for uh, testing out some of the new components. Um, and then uh, chat says .NET 6 Preview is dropping soon. That's correct. Yeah, they've already started specking that out on the GitHub repo. So you can go check out the, uh, I think, the roadmap on some of the things that they're thinking about um, for .NET 6. So. Enjoying Visual Studio. Give me, oh, you don't want to know, buddy. <laughs> you don't want to know. So this is something that I'm working on. I'll give you a quick run here and show you a little preview sure. for tomorrow. Because... Um, if there's anything that we need on uh, the web, you know, name name one type of thing that we need more than anything else, John, and that's a uh, in-browser Markdown editor, right? Sure, why not? So why not? Why not you know, hey, I use Dillinger or you know, yeah. anything else. But hey, if you got something for with, me, I'm happy uh, to look at it. and Teller QI and you can sure. come in here and you can bring it on. You know, make your uh, Markdown file right here in the browser, or you can edit it with a yeah, you know, what you see is what you get. Uh, yeah, yeah. Editor, right? You got Not to get nice... off on a rant here, but I would really like to see Markdown start to adopt more uh, extensions, like mm -hmm. uh, you know, graphing and charting Markdowns. There's, there's stuff to that. There okay. is. If you look hard enough, you'll find it. Um, yeah, I know, but it's just it's just it's non-standard. That's that's the point. Yeah. So. Yeah, I get you. So I mean, we could pull in uh, blog yeah. posts from our our GitHub repos and just it's. There's like no code behind this thing almost, John. And it's just a couple lines of code. It's pretty astonishing what you can accomplish with the right tools. And what is it? What is the old say what is the old expression I got trash for? Friends don't let friends do drag and drop demos. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so uh, not dragging and dropping, but um, just the the components themselves, they do what they're supposed to do with very little need to like babysit them. You're like, here's the sure. data. You display it how it's supposed to come out, and uh, Blazor is just easy at hooking and wiring things together. So, I mean, it's it's like two lines of code to make a markdown editor. It's, it's yeah. bananas. And then you That's throw uh, splitter panels in like this, and you've got, you know, that uh, desktop type of a... You can make your yep. own, like, Visual Studio type environment. I like to, it. To make an editor and, um, you know... Yeah, Markdown's a good so investment, I think. If, if you're looking at something that's easy uh, and something that will serve you well going forward, learn Markdown. Uh, it's used everywhere. Um, oh, I love Markdown. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just pretty easy to write and uh, makes a lot of sense uh, when you start getting hang of it. Uh, the hardest thing I had doing with, with Markdown was tables. That was always a challenge to try and get right. Like, why is it not rendering my table, you know? And there are tools to help you with that as well. Yeah, when I'm working on the desktop, I use this one. Markdown Monsters, okay. always a good one. Uh, yep. This one's got like that side by side. You know, sure. This is basically what I built in Blazor in 10 minutes. But um, this has uh, extra support for tables and things like that. Yeah. There are, there are some really good tools that integrate with VS Code as well that will generate auto-generate table of contents for you. So if you have headers like H1s, H2s, uh, it will auto-generate table of contents for you at the top of the page. So there's add-ins and extensions you can add to Visual Studio Code that will do that as well. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, we've got lots of folks in the chat room today, so just want to say thanks, everybody, for coming out and showing us some support on a Monday afternoon. Or Tuesday yeah. morning, if you're John. And, it's Australia uh, Day here, mate. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, so thank you very much, John. It was always great talking to you. And uh, Likewise. Enjoyed burning down CES with you this, this time around. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Uh, sorry to all the folks who are watching this and thinking, geez, John's in a bad mood. It's just I really I care about the environment. I worry about all this consumerism stuff that we're building. We're solving problems that, you know, I don't. I didn't realize were problems before. So anyway. I don't, ha I don't have the trash bin icon on my screen, but essentially I can picture you dragging like all of CES into the little bin. Just like, <laughs> hey, 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 I like innovation just as much as the next person, but I also like it for the right reasons. So, Yep. All right, man. Thank you so much. And uh, we will see you all tomorrow for the webinar. I'm sure everybody will be there. So I'll get to talk to you again tomorrow. And um, we also have a stream coming up on Friday. It's an extended version of the webinar. We'll build and do more live coding stuff. 
So uh, make sure you tune in all week uh, on Coded Live. Thanks. We'll see you soon. See ya.